Joanna Price joins the Plutopia podcast this time as we discuss online communities. We look at what works and what doesn't work in virtual gathering places. On the internet, we're very aware of trolls, right? Folks who do come in to intentionally cause trouble. And one of the goals of the kind of community that I'm envisioning is that, you know, it's a hundred people max. It probably starts out with somebody and uh, some people they know, right? Um, uh, either on the internet or in real life. And it expands um, in, a, in a less dramatic advertised way, right? In a sort of natural way that makes it less likely that you will get explicit trolling. But were that to occur, you know, that would be, that would, I think, fall under the bad acting notion of, you know, we just ban them. Um, and, and, you know, I, I say we ban trolls and I think I don't want to suggest that there's no place for dark humor or, you know, fun, right? Like there's a difference between, uh, you know, there's, when we say trolling, we can mean a few different things. And sometimes we're talking about what is essentially making jokes. And that's one thing. And sometimes we're talking about, you know, stuff that's a lot darker and a lot worse than that. Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, our latest Plutopia News Network podcast. I'm John Lebkowski, and my partner over there is Scoop Sweeney. And today, Scoop and I are going to be interviewing Joanna Price, who is a public librarian. But she, more than being a public librarian, she has a, a, a real interest in building communities and how communities are built online, and it's something that we have discussed a bit on The Well. Uh, people who followed us know that I'm a member of The Well, which is uh, probably the oldest online community still standing. Um, Joanna is interested in building resilient, creative, and compassionate community, and she's been focused on conceiving and building a community that she is calling Elms Bright, and we'll talk about that a bit today. Hi. How are you doing, Joanna? Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm doing good. It's the beginning of my weekend, so I'm relaxing, and I'm excited to talk. Oh, cool. Well, I guess the best way for us to start is, is to talk a little bit about the online community that you've that you've mentioned that you want to build, and I, I get the impression that you're in a discovery phase you haven't really built a platform that's right uh, can you can you say a little bit about what you've been learning in your discovery phase yeah absolutely so you know i think that um elms bright as envisioned by me originally was a way of helping people you know i see them as being participating in social media and feeling very sometimes alienated by it on, in, a, in like a conditional way, right? So it's, so like we as a group, we being millennials as a group tend to uh, respond to things like Twitter and Facebook and Meta and these large companies with a certain amount of alienation. And I wanted to create a small reproducible community that helped people feel more in control um, and more empowered and more capable and also in community at the same time, right? So supported. Um, and that's, it's actually really difficult to do in today's climate because uh, we're sort of brought up in this culture of um, everybody's a jerk on the internet and everybody just knows that and we accept it, right? So if you read like even a lot of the media that comes out, articles about social media today, there's a lot of discussion of like, did this cross the line from, okay, normal jerk on the internet to too much, right? And we're try I'm trying to push back on that a little bit. Like normal jerk is too much jerk, right? Like we it's we are capable of having a fundamentally kind and supportive community platform. Obviously, humor is good and we like humor, but um that variety of thing. And so there's a question of how you translate that into a methodology, you know, and into tools and into um logistics. And it's really uh not easy because one of the things I'm trying to prioritize is an easy, predictable process so that somebody who is mostly a layman could start one of these communities. Um, and the general sort of process that I envision or idea that I envision here is that you're creating a small town vibe, that the community is structured like a small town of out of Lord of the Rings, or like if you're a if you're a gamer, um, 
like one of those farming simulations like Stardew Valley, where you um, have all of these different locations that relate to real life activities, but also are part of a communal idea of a town. Um, and so I think for me right now in the discovery phase, the platform that has really stood out is discourse. Um, and that platform, there's many, there's like a million and five ways to implement it. And it's difficult. I'm still trying to figure out how to make it as predictable and out of the box as possible. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the challenge that I'm facing right now. After having looked at multiple forums and multiple ways of connecting, I, just, I do think, originally I was thinking about doing a BBS because I wanted to have a threshold so that somebody who participated in the community felt like they crossed a threshold and were participating in something separate that they'd done a little work to join. Um, I think that I sort of let go of that idea, not because I did end up SSHing into uh, the well on Putty, which was awesome. But I, I think what ultimately decided me was less that it was too complicated and more that it completely excluded anyone who didn't have access to, you know, like a desktop PC, right? Like no one's going onto a BBS from their smartphone. And while ideally everybody has access to that sort of computer, I didn't want to make access a hard stop, right? I, yeah, well, I, could, I should say you, you can log in from your... Yeah from your phone through like a browser on your phone, yeah. but it's not as easy to do that way. Yeah. Yeah. You can get out uh, to the sorry, well Scoop, your phone. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. John and I grew up and got on while well, we failed to grow up. We got <laughs> online in the age of the BBS when that was, yes. that was the only community you could get online yeah. basically, except for an occasional email or a chat group and a news group. But the whole idea of the BBS was, being around like-minded people, people with a different, uh, or with, with similar interests. And so you would find that BBS that fit you. And it sounds like that's what you're looking for is being people being able to have, uh, um, groups that, uh, they can identify with rather than just being in some, you know, big collection of massive collection of strangers. Yeah, and I think that I envision it also as being a learning environment, a place where people gain skills uh, or at least get to try out new things uh, in fizz space. Somebody on the well said fizz space instead of meat space, and I immediately adopted fizz space. I was like, this is a much better that, term. That was me, yeah. Oh, it was you. Okay, fizz space. Yeah, it was. Substantially better yeah. term. And I um, actually picked, I, I used to have a, a company called Fringeware, uh, with a partner, Paco Nathan, who came up with that term, fizz space. Um, yeah. And uh, we actually, we built a community without kind of not intending to. We we thought we were building a company and we had the idea of selling products online, which was pretty revolutionary at the time we were thinking about it because nobody was doing it and you weren't really supposed to do it with the... Uh, NSF backbone that we had at the time. But um, but we were working on this idea and we set up an email list. Uh, uh, I think originally our thought was to source products through that list and to get ideas for this business we were going to put together. But it turned into a, a, a community. It attracted a lot of fringe people, strange, very strange people showed up, uh, including us. And uh, we had an exercise in community building. And one of the things that you could see from that is that it's not always even easy to predict where a community will form. Uh, but the internet gives you platforms that facilitate that, te technologies that facilitate that. And in our case, it started with an email list. With the well, it started with a BBS. You're talking about discourse, which is just a developed platform that's similar to a BBS model. Um, so there's yeah. a bunch of different ways to do it. I, I guess my question for you is, do you have a specific kind of person that you want to, to attract to a community or are you more interested in, in sort of like creating a structure that people can use as a model for various kinds of affinities. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that there's two things going on. One, there is a community that I personally want to start, right? Secondarily, I want to create a model that would allow people with different affinities to adopt a structure that still has at its base, you know, this idea of community, individual empowerment, kindness, right? Like those sort of, this sort of idea of like becoming more capable, you know, finding resilience in community, but maybe, maybe not around the exact same things that, um, the way that I envision mine. And one thing I think is that for me, I would really, I would really like to see some, some intergenerational, um, community. And I came to the well originally because I see a line, um, sort of a narrative line from the way that community was thought about in early compute in early computing online to what I'm trying to do now, right? So I am trying to build something that is in the legacy of these ideas intentionally. And I think that that is why that was such an important place for me to have this conversation, right? Um, because I really think that back in the time of the whole Earth catalog and the well, which is the whole Earth electronic link, there was this this nice parallel between things that you could do individually to become more capable and and this notion of community and this notion of community that sort of belonged to, you know, as you were saying earlier, you said French folks, but, you know, people who don't necessarily, you know, jump onto Twitter and feel right at home, right? People who are looking for something. Um, so the, the term I've used is alienated, but I don't want to suggest that, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're like, gee, I feel alienated today, right? But more like as a condition in our lives, right, that we, you know, uh, sort of experience a separateness in that sense. Yeah, I mean, the way we saw it, uh, again, this was in building a fringeware, but I extended it to other things I did too. I, I realized that one of the powers of the internet was that you had people who were isolated in their communities, especially smaller communities, you know, in a big city, you can find almost anything. But if, if you're in a smaller area, a rural area or whatever, you, you may be kind of uh, th uh, thinking outside the box and most people are not. So where do you find people who you can really communicate with and feel comfortable with? You're not necessarily comfortable with the people who live in your physical community, but if you can get online, you can find people who have an the same affinities that you have. And there's a potential to build communities with people like that. And that was, that was kind of what was happening with us back then. And that I think at the very beginning of the mainstreaming of the internet, I think many of the early adopters were people who were like that, who did actually feel that they were in whatever area, you know, they were physically, were not really able to quite connect with the people that they wanted to. And then there were other people who just didn't have geographical proximity, but they're like, for instance, early in the history of the well, there were a lot of writers and journalists who became members of the well because it was one place where they could show up, that they could talk to other writers or journalists, some of which they they kind of knew by reputation, but really didn't have an opportunity to talk to because they might be, you know, on a different coast or whatever. So so that's a powerful part of the internet. I think we've kind of a little bit, you'd think that social media was really facilitating that, but I don't really think it is. And one of the weaknesses I think of social media is it's a scattershot of comments. You know, you don't have coherent discussion as readily as you do people just kind of throwing posts at each other. I call it drive-by posting. And, and to me, the way that you build a community is that you give people an opportunity to have conversations that build a history over time. Right. Absolutely. Um, medium to long-term relationships, certainly. I think also yeah. um, Howard Rangel talks about this a little bit in his book, Virtual Community. Even back then, he says, you know, I predict that if we're not careful, this, you know, these opportunities are going to become commodified and sold back to us. And I think one of the things that we are experiencing is, you know, 
transactional relationships, you know, that, that they don't, they, um, there's a lot of conversation about how Twitter is the town square. Um, but I think the truth is that in any community that is, that's essentially has to be profitable as a, you know, um, as a, an inherent part of the system is always going to, uh, expend, you know, people are always going to be the expense. Real authentic relationships are always going to be the expense. That's not to say that an organization could not be profitable, right? Or that you couldn't have a business model that was successful, but you have to be able, you have to be able to prioritize um, the thing in any given system you design, right? If the output you want is profit, that's the first thing, then all of the other things are going to fall under that, right? But if you make you know, your outcome, what you want is successful community. It doesn't mean that profit is impossible, but it does need to come after that, right? It needs to be the consideration that's secondary. Um, and I think that's a problem we run into with Meta and with Twitter. And it's something that I'm trying to avoid. There are expenses involved in creating community, right? Actual costs, like financial costs and time resources. Um, and a, a big challenge for me is trying to balance the realistic and appropriate use of resources against uh, the traditional models that really, I think, really focus a lot more on consumption. And that's hard. That's hard to really navigate for me. And that's, you know, when I'm looking at platforms, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to find that balance and find a way that's, you know, that it, where it where it scales and it works for sort of a diverse number of people. Where technical neither technical nor business expertise is necessary. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Twitter. Uh, well, formerly Twitter, now uh, X. X. Yeah. And that was, uh, at the time, a very nice uh, public square. I when, when I first got on it, it was great. And when it changed uh, and, the, and the moderators went away, it just became you know, a, a free fire zone for bad personalities. And you see the, th the same thing on Facebook. I participate on Facebook um, only in the way of sharing memes that I think are funny because I don't have the time to waste my writing and producing skills on stuff that's just going to attract uh, crazy peoples <laughs> because I have a lot of those on my feed. So <laughs> do you foresee requiring moderation on, uh, yes. And yes, how absolutely. would how would that how would you see that uh, happening? What kind of people would you have moderating? That's a really great question, and I've thought about this a lot. Moderation is difficult, um, and uh, I think that a successful moderator is somebody who is, um you know, fundamentally a kind person. And this comes from public librarianship. You know, at the public library, we get people in to the library who are very difficult to deal with, but 99% of them are in the midst of some kind of struggle, right? And, you know, very few people come into the public library who intend to cause trouble because they're bad actors. They are people who are causing trouble as an, as a sort of as a side effect of their own suffering, right? And that doesn't mean that we always let them stay in the library because sometimes you cannot do that. But it does mean that we regard the way that we manage that space from a compassionate perspective as opposed to um, sort of a, a ban hammer rules-based perspective. And, and moderation is a combination of being able to recognize the limits that you need to respect while also allowing for the fact that just because these limits need to be respected and need to be enforced does not inherently mean anything about the people who are in that space, right? And that kind of perspective, I think, lends the best form of moderation because it's fair um, and it doesn't, it's not condemning in its nature. Now, you have, you know, on the internet, we're very aware of trolls, right? Folks who do come in to intentionally cause trouble. And one of the goals of the kind of community that I'm envisioning is that, you know, it's a hundred people max. It probably starts out with somebody and uh, some people they know, right? Um, 
uh, either on the internet or in real life, and it expands um, in a in a less dramatic advertised way, right? In a sort of natural way that makes it less likely that you will get explicit trolling. But were that to occur, you know, that would be, that would, I think, fall under the bad acting notion of, the, you know, we just ban them. Um, and, and, you know, I, I say we ban trolls and I think I don't want to suggest that there's no place for dark humor or, you know, fun, right? Like there's a difference between, uh, you know, there's, when we say trolling, we can mean a few different things. And sometimes we're talking about what is essentially making jokes. And that's one thing. And sometimes we're talking about, you know, stuff that's a lot darker and a lot worse than that. Yeah, you can, you can tell a truly destructive troll, usually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, what we call hosts on the well now, the original term for the, uh, for that role was fair witness. And uh, I thought it was, that was actually a good, good fit. Fair witness, that's good. Sort of shortened it to host, but yeah. And the way hosting has worked there pretty successfully is basically kind of a light touch. You have minimal rules and, you know, you do sometimes have to enforce the rules, but there's not that many of them. And I think in most conferences on the well, most of the places where people are are interacting the primary rule is no ad hominem attacks. You just don't attack people. And uh, and that's the the rule that is most readily enforced there. So, you know, I would say I don't think you have to have a lot of rules, but sometimes you have to sort of shape the conversations or stimulate the conversations as a, a moderator. Mm -hmm. I think also we really we are currently living through a time of heightened identity politics, and that's tougher to moderate. So for example, there's a Facebook community I'm part of, and somebody made a post recently and this, and they said, I'm genuinely curious, what is your take on adopting indigenous American spiritual practices if you do not have any indigenous DNA, right? That is not an ad hominem attack. That is in no way you know, inherently offensive. There's nothing about it. That, there's no swear words, whatever. But a lot of people are going to feel very defensive and very offended by that question and respond in a way, even if it isn't a direct insult, is very argumentative. And so I think a thing that um, that I'm aware of that comes up a lot in terms of moderating is when people have opinions about topics that are that they believe relate directly to who they are, right? Even if it isn't about them personally. Um, and those kinds of conversations have really been dominating a lot of the public discourse in various places and is a thing that I worry about with moderation and, you know, and uh, communities is how specifically do you navigate the debates that in which people feel someone else's opinion is talking about them directly, even if it isn't about them personally. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a part of the problem that you you have in sort of managing the, the conversations in any community setting or, or social setting online is that you do have people who show up who have very different mindsets, very different belief systems. Uh, there's a potential for that, and it can be very difficult to integrate them into the conversation. And uh, I can tell you that, you know, from all the years I've been hosting conversations on the well, that occasionally we'll have somebody who will show up who really kind of doesn't doesn't get it. They sort of they feel kind of like a square peg in there, or sometimes they. They troll without realizing they're trolling, if you yeah. if you can imagine that. I mean, there are trolls who don't really realize that's what they're doing. They don't really kind of understand the yeah. way that they're, you know, the way that their conversational structures uh, are working or are perceived. And it's a challenge to deal with those things. You don't want to say to somebody, say, well, you're just not a good fit here. you got to leave. Right. But then you got to think about how do you fit them into the conversation? We have, we have um, uh, some, I'm aware of some 
some uh, conferences on the well. And conferences are like, for people who don't know the well, they're right. like kind of main subject areas. And then you have topics within those conversations, which are within those, uh, I'm sorry, those conferences, which are the conversations. And, uh, and you can have people show up in a conference who are really sort of like at odds or they kind of don't fit or the way they think is really different from everybody else. Uh, and, and it may be a matter of adapting to social customs, or it may be a matter of, of getting to a level of civility that works for that conversational yeah. environment. But whatever it is, the host sort of has the responsibility to try to figure out how to make that work and and whether they should be sidelining this person or having a side conversation with them or banning them from the conference for some period of time or whatever, you know? Yeah, and I um, think that is the thing that strikes me as the most challenging in moderation, right? When somebody shows up and they don't know that they're trolling, right? that is that's the difficult thing right um and so you know there's elaborate there have been elaborate exercises to try to avoid this you know like trainings and things like that but at the end of the day i think that everybody has some area around which when they start talking about it because of their feelings that are attached to it, right? That this is this is how it is for them. And it's not the same thing for everybody, but I think most people have that experience in some realm, right? Um, like none of us are Buddha, right? And we can't have that level of calm about everything. So, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's how, do you, as a, how do you as a moderator get somebody to, to come to enough self-awareness to realize that, that though their feelings and their thoughts may be valid, that this is not the right, this is not going to produce the result that will make them feel better, right? And that, I think that's the challenge. So for me, when I think about moderators, I have a few friends who um, are very, very dedicated to being diplomatic, right? Who prioritize everybody getting along and doing well over any specific point of view. And I think that that, that is a feature, right? People who are naturally inclined towards that disposition are going to be better moderators. That's what I've been thinking. Yeah, I uh, used to encounter a lot more trolls online than I have lately. And I found out from a rather conservative friend that I grew up with that I just encountered. And I said, well, you haven't been bothering me or you, none of your friends have been bothering me lately. And he said, well, we all went over to Trump social. I went, wow, a finally a positive influence of Trump social. It, it reminds me of how they used to, uh, uh, how law enforcement and uh, computer security people used to catch evil hackers and they do what's called a honeypot where you and put something out there that is really attractive and they all, all the bees go to that, all the trolls go to Trump social. So I, I never thought I would have to say that, but, uh, well, thankfully they're all going over, over there. And they're, yeah. they, they've been put on time out in their little chair in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. It is definitely to some degree that separation is good and warranted because you know it would be illusory to suggest that just about anybody can be in the same virtual room with just about anybody and at the same time you don't want everyone to be in the, in the room to be the same right like nobody wants that either so that's another balancing act um i think it's it's difficult especially where explicit politics are concerned and one of the things that I'm thinking about with Elms Bright, with the specific community that I am envisioning, not the model, is just have it just just being explicitly anti-political, right? Just there is no that is not the mode with which we are relating to each other in this community. It doesn't matter whether you're a liberal or conservative, what your identity or demographics are, you know, and if that's not something that you're willing, that's not a space you're willing to enter with that those rules, that's fine, right? It's not for you and that's fine. But I'm contemplating that because I don't want to moderate and I don't want to ask anyone else to moderate, you know, 
uh, the the sort of volatile stuff that comes up with political identity specifically. That sounds like uh, the rules I have uh, around Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner yes. with family. It's like no religion, no politics, and uh, no personal fights by, with your cousin that you're angry about the way they treated you 20 years ago. It's like, keep it nice, and uh, everybody will have uh, not have upset di digestion after Thanksgiving. There you go. And I think um, almost everything can be seen through multiple lenses, right? So it, it is not to say that if you can't speak about something politically, you can't speak about it, right? It's a question of your approach. Uh, and that's the that's the thing that I'm really sort of narrowing in on. And I think part of it is also that, I mean, I don't know how common this is um, for you, but for me, among my peers, I think there are a lot of people who don't understand that there are other lenses with which one can approach the same thing, right? So politics has come to really dominate the way that my peers go here, right? You know, I'm a liberal or I'm conservative and like, and these are our sides, right? You know, I'm conservative, but I'm never Trump. So I'm over here in this corner with these people, right? And they're, you know, it's not like, uh, uh, I'm a never Trumper who likes to build aquariums and I hang out with this progressive person over here and we talk about building aquariums together, right? Like that's never, that kind of, that kind of overlap doesn't happen because people are picking their teams, right? Um, and like you described Thanksgiving dinner, right? In an ideal world, you can find a way to not make that the primary lens with which you view the thing you're talking about, the relationship you're having. I uh, was trying to remember. Oh, I did. I think I, I did find it actually. So there is an organization called Braver Angels that I'm aware of. And what they're specifically working on is trying to get people to communicate uh, red to blue and blue to red. They're trying to get people to talk to each other across the political spectrum. And uh, so I think there's a place for that. And I think that it ha requires some very careful and skilled facilitation. So it's not necessarily something than you do in a more informal online community. But yeah. it would be nice to build spaces for that. What One of the things I was talking about when you were talking about kind of how moderation should work is the problem of scale. And one of the problems with social media is that there's so many people who are in the social media space. There's so many people who are on X or there's so many people who are on Facebook uh, the expense and difficulty of moderating all those conversations is is uh, uh, is kind of impossible. I mean, moderation just inherently isn't going to work because you can't commit the right level of skill and the right amount of time to it. Uh, so one one issue in setting up communities is figuring out what scale will work. You know, have you have you been thinking about that for? Or yeah. what you um, want to conceive, you know, like an upward limit or. Yeah. So discourse, you know, they talk about uh, members and staff. That's how they put it, right? Staff. So I would say one staff member for every 10 members, including that staff member for a maximum of 100 people in a community, 10 of which are moderators. And that comes from this notion that you know, uh, moderators are going to be online at different times, you know, um, and I think that one to 10 is a pretty good, it's a pretty good ratio. That's what I was envisioning, um, you know, 10 staff for 100 max. Um, and uh, I don't know whether that's too many, but, you know, probably, probably better to start out with slightly too many than slightly too few. So. Yeah, I came up with a, a structure that I could kind of chart, and it was just basically, it was like a fried egg. It was like concentric circles, right? So at the very center of the circle, the smallest little circle at the center, those are the people who sort of own the community, uh, own in the sense of being responsible for it, I guess. Um, 
And then there is the next circle out, the people who manage the community. And there may be some overlap between those two. And then the next circle out, you have people who are actively speaking in the community. And um, those are, it can almost be like performers on a stage because the next circle out is people that we used to refer to as lurkers. Uh, well, I guess we still refer to them as lurkers. And they're people who show up, but they don't really say very much or they don't really type very much. They just are paying attention to what's going on. So they're kind of like an audience. And the people who actually do speak up are kind of like performers. And then you've yeah. got the people who are managing. They're kind of like directors. I mean, you could you could use a performance analogy for it. But that, I always thought that was a pretty good sense of the structure of any online community. They tend to kind of shake out that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think the question is just how big do you want the ring of community managers to be relative to the ring of community members, right? Circle. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the host, you use, I mean, on the well, you usually have two hosts for a, a conference and a conference will have who knows how many people in it. You know, it might be 20 and it might be 200 or 300. I'm in a conference that is one of the busiest conferences on the well. I'm one of the co-hosts and there's four hosts for that conference. It was managed by one guy for a long time and he was sort of overwhelmed with with the job of trying to manage those conversations. Uh, but it has worked pretty well with four. And then there was also the question of gender. You know, it, it turns out that sometimes men are insensitive to women and vice versa. Uh, the, their gender differences come into play. And it turns out that it's a good idea to have both genders and hosting of the the well because yeah. people will see things like women will see things that guys won't see, you know. Um yeah. I mean I hate to say it, but it's it's true. And and uh I've had situations where it was somebody had to point out to me that somebody was being kind of sexist because it it wasn't as obvious to me. I didn't see it, you know, not you know, I'm not a I'm not sexist or anything like that, but I just couldn't see it. You know, it was just a yeah. gender thing. Right. And I think that, you know, where representation is concerned, that's always true, right? Like, you know, whatever it is, identity it is that you inhabit, it is more likely that you will perceive hostility towards that identity than someone who doesn't inhabit it. Um and that's also true. You definitely want that kind of representation and moderation. I'm really hoping that because these communities that I'm envisioning are, you know, a max of 100 people, because I imagine that they begin amongst a small group of people who already know each other, you know, that you end up with a coherent structure through the mechanisms of social networking, not just online social networking, but in general, social networking. A place like The Well um you know it's it's much bigger um it's much bigger and uh so i think that you know if you could envision it as you know every conference is its own a little separate community right that hopefully it coheres a little bit better i'm hoping yeah well, that, that's a great, great great point uh there tends to be as as a, a community scales up there tends to be a clustering effect People go off in clusters. Sorry, Scoop, I talked over yeah, you there. That's okay. Uh, I like the idea of 100 uh, max uh, participants because that's more in line with your actual life, unless you're just a really popular person and have yeah. thousands of people thronging to see your every uh, movement. And I just get a little nervous when I'm in a big social media uh, crowd because you you have very little chance of actually 
having a conversation. You can just do drive-by comments that you may be able to get one in and then somebody else and, you know, you have hundreds of people coming in and it's just no way to communicate with people. You can, you know, make a random comment and that's about it on uh, the big social media platforms. Yeah. And I would say that you are actually pretty unlucky if your random comment gets too much attention. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's a bad thing. So like, you know, uh, they, they make this joke, who's the main character on Twitter today, right? And you never want to be the main character on Twitter. So I think it's, uh, it, it's very difficult to build relationships, but also it's, um, it's actively detrimental to try you know, to try to be, uh, express yourself wholly and fully on social media that's that broad. I think Facebook is a little bit better um, than Twitter in that way, and that it's, you know, it's, you're able, if you want, to create a uh, experience for yourself that's a lot more constrained. Um, and because its roots are in people that you know personally, like Facebook, when it originated, it was like, it was based on the idea of a yearbook. And it was only if you had an EDU address after you graduated high school for keeping up with people that you knew, right? And to this day, the people that are most active on Facebook that I know um, are people who are keeping up with people that they know. Um, so it's a little different. Um, it's, it's, it's had its fair share of issues, but I think that the problems that Twitter presents, um, you know, it's not so much a public square because the thing about public squares is that they, there's no public square for the for the entire world, right? That's not the, a public square in reality when you picture one in your head belongs to a town, right? You're not like, I'm going to get on a plane and go to the Earth's public square. Like, that's not a thing. Um, so I think that it's, you know, it is, it wasn't a given, right? It wouldn't have been obvious, but it turns out that um, that kind of structure that theoretically brings everybody together from all over the place is actually doing a lot more to drive people apart. Um, and it's getting, it's getting substantially worse under Olan. Um, and I don't know, honestly, whether Jack is going to be able to turn it around at all with Blue Sky. But I, you know, I think that I don't really blame the people who first envisioned it. I think that was something we had to learn, you know? Um, I don't know that it would have been obvious to me if you had asked me before Twitter started whether a community where anybody from all over the world could log on and interact with anybody else, right, would be um, the way that Twitter is, would have that sort of inherent issue. I'm not sure I would have known. Well, there's there's kind of a problem with, it's kind of a capitalist problem, really, you know? Yeah. Uh, the way a capitalist sees the world is in terms of their resources to exploit. Yeah. And the the project of capitalism is figuring out how to exploit resources to make profits and build wealth. So when you see a number of people paying attention to a particular space, that attention is a resource that can be exploited. In other words, you can sell advertising. You know, that that's kind of the model for that. So you you ca you've captured a lot of attention and it's hard to resist the gravity of capitalism that pulls you in the direction of wanting to exploit that resource. So Twitter was constantly pressured to try to figure out a way to make money. I don't know that you know, people like Jack and Evan, some of the people who started Twitter were actually thinking so hard about making a bunch of money with it when they got into it. But the pressure is just there when you actually have the opportunity. It's it's hard to, to resist. So what happened with Twitter was that so many people came into it that were seeing it opportunistically you know people would try to like there were people who would give courses in how to build a, a twitter following there were people who would buy followers so that it would appear that they had a big twitter following that it was somewhat the conversations were somewhat corrupted by the uh the mainstreaming of the community and and the i guess the 
the appearance of actors who were more interested in in leveraging the attention to serve their ends, either by sell, selling advertising or just by trying to build some kind of reputation or whatever, becoming an influencer, as they call them. Mm -hmm. And then on yeah. Facebook, you had kind of a similar problem. And another thing that you have with Facebook and probably with Twitter, too, is that when you post something on Facebook, you don't know who's going to see it. You know who your friends are. You, I mean, you can see who you're connected to on Facebook, but there's an algorithm that will decide who sees what. And it does it based on data about engagement. You know, so if a post is engaging, it gets shown to more and more people. But it's hard to have a conversation if you don't know who for sure who's listening, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, I, I think that, an issue that capitalism has, um, I think the guy's name is David Harvey, who originally said this, but it it has to expand, right? It can't exploit resources and then stop because it's exploited the resources it needs to. It needs to continuously exploit resources. And so it's, it's, pro it's progressively taking over. It's moving into spaces it wasn't in before, both geographically and virtually. Um, in order to do that, right? In order to keep generating profit. And I think that um, uh, where where something like Twitter is concerned, we, we have this, uh, this problem of also of where attention is a product of, they've noticed that people tend to pay more attention when they're angry. Um, and so we also have this algorithm that is, because paying, you know, your attention and not leaving the app is important. That's designed to, you know, make you really unhappy, right? And when you're unhappy, the way you're socializing with other people on that platform is going to reflect that. One of the things I know is as well. One of the things I noticed as well is that um, people tend to respond to a desire to be part of something, part of a group, to belong to a group, um, and so. You know, when I started envisioning Elms Bright, I started thinking about how do we have a healthy respect for individuality and expressing yourself, right? And, you know, feeling safe to do so, not feeling like you have to agree or go along with in order to be part of, right? Um, and that that ended up being a, a very large factor in what I was thinking about. And it was a little strange for me because usually I think of that as the idea of liberty, right? That individual sense of freedom. I think of that as being very closely tied to conservatism, not MAGA conservatism, but traditional conservatism, this notion of of individual liberty, right? Um, but I had to rethink about it in terms of what it means to maintain a sense of who you are and also have the safety and support of belonging to something larger, right? That was that was something that came out of Twitter for me in thinking about virtual community um, is the role that liberty, you know, in the almost in the purely Americana sense plays, right? Yeah, in the early days of the web, when everyone just had to have a website, and even if they didn't have any reason to have a website, they had to have one anyway because everyone else was building a website. And there became a thing called click farms. And that was where people wanted to really make their website look big and popular. And they would hire people that had a big call center. And all they did was go on occasionally, at, well, quite often, and click on stuff on this guy's website or this woman's website, whatever. And it just became ridiculous because there was no real reason <laughs> for these people to be going there other than someone was paying them to click on stuff and, you know, show how popular this website is. And that eventually ended when, you know, you know, in the early 2000s, when, you know, the webs pretty much went away in a lot of cases because all these people went bankrupt because they were spending money for no good reason. And you're seeing that in social media as well. You just because, you have the money to do these things doesn't mean that you really need to, you know, unless you have something really good to give to people on these sites. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, we still have SEO. So, and we still have page rank, which is that Google algorithm that's very similar, right? The more it's accessed by people, the higher it's going to appear in the Google results. Um, so it's not so far off from click farms. I think uh, I recently started paying for a service, um, for, for a search service, because I've just decided I was done with Google. Um, and that has been a lot more gratifying in terms of finding information, which is something I do a lot for my job. So <laughs> um, I think that that ultimately this notion of click farms and this idea of, um, I don't know if you've heard of this phrase, the inshittification, right? That part of this seeking out profit is making the purpose of the original thing worse, making it less good, less functional, less capable of doing what it's supposed to do such as Google and search um, or Twitter and socially network. Yeah, that, our pal Corey came up with that term in shittification. Oh. And uh, you can see the term everywhere these days, but you can also see the actual instance of in in many places. And it's a, uh, it's a sad thing, really. And it, you know, Community resists exploitation, and uh, when you have a, a a pretty significant degree of exploitation within a community, and it's visible, the community starts to kind of evaporate, or the sense of community anyway. Yeah. Uh, though I'm I'm a little bit surprised that X has managed to hold together. I thought it would have collapsed before now, but it actually seems to be, if anything, picking up steam. It seems to be just kind of rocking along, but it's kind of a weird universe too, because you have so many people who have migrated to uh, Mastodon and so many who have migrated to Blue Sky and so many who have migrated to Threads. So it's some, it's been kind of broken up, yeah. balkanized, you know, you've got people kind of all over the place. It's hard to uh, decide for someone like me. I mean, I have tended to show up in a lot of these online spaces, and it's hard for me right now to decide where I want to go and, and you know, kind of where do I find the sense of affinity with others. I can feel that in one sense on Mastodon and another sense on Blue Sky. And I don't get any sense of community from any of those places in the same sense that I have, uh, uh, that I feel that I'm in a community on the well. Yeah. Yeah. I, w I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Um, and it, it is more or less what I expected, you know, when I joined the well about a month ago, um, I, I, I had a pretty good idea actually of what I was getting into already because I, you know, I had read Fred Turner's book. I had done at some point, I fell down a rabbit hole reading about all of this stuff. Um, and, you know, it all came together sort of at the same time for me where it was like, okay, I kind of want to start an internet community. I really want to follow the footsteps of these things that I've read about, you know, and it's still here. And like, you know, I could get, I could get online and talk to these people, you know, and learn a lot, you know, and learn more. And one thing that comes up is that it's very easy. It's so easy to idealize something that you read about. Right. Um, and so, I was like, let me let me participate in this community and really see what the ambiguities are and the gray spaces are and where the things are that you don't that don't fall neatly into a narrative. Um, and that's in some ways the joy of it, right? Because anything you read, like a book, is gonna already is gonna have a edited narrative, and that's good because a book should, right? Um, and what you, I think, what I one thing that I've really enjoyed on the well is the way that, you know, the sort of ambiguities of people and the sort of idiosyncrasies come out, right? And you get to see um, uh, not just community and it's like idealistic on paper form, but the way it works, you know? Uh, and that's uh, something that I'm trying very hard to, you know, pay close attention to and think about um, when I think about designing a community, because it's very easy for me to think about all the things I want, right? And all the ways I want people to feel, you know, and all the things I want, you know, and all of these things. But really, when it when it comes to belonging to a community, it 
a core part of it is that it's doing things that you didn't necessarily expect, right? That's that's like, that means it's succeeding, right? When there's connections being made that you didn't put on your map. What kinds of people were you uh, hoping to attract specifically to Elmsbright? What What is it? it what kind of community will that be? I, uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's very, it's very much of a reach. Um, and so I don't want to say this as though, you know, uh, it's something I necessarily expect, but in a perfect world, I would really like an intergenerational space between people I know who are very actively thinking about m creating healthier community online and people who have created healthier community online. So I have friends who are ex-employees of places like Facebook and Twitter, and they left largely because they felt that they were not helping, things were going badly, and they have an, a keen and active interest in finding a community that's a little different or building one, right? Um, and I don't think that we need to reinvent the wheel to do so. Uh, I don't, right? Like, I think that those ideas are really really um, very much in the early computing days. Like I think they're very explicitly there and they were written about at great length and thought about really well. Um, and and then, you know, I am aware coming out of the whole earth catalog, I, I had this weird parallel moment where I'm like, and I, and I said this on the well, I was like, you know, I've never actually, I've been talking about BBSs. I've never actually been on one. I've only ever played a computer game where you get on one, right? And similarly, I have a lot of peers who are spending a lot of time simulating experiences that they want to have, right? And it's, and it's like, this is, you know, we can, we can uh, feasibly bridge this gap. Um, and, and this DIY aspect is part of it. There are, people simulating all kinds of farming stuff and businesses and, and skilled labor, right? Like they're getting online or they're getting on their computers and they're pretending to grow crops, right? And they're pretending to do these things. And games are good. They're a form of relaxation. But in my opinion, um, they're being offered also, you know, this sort of escape that that it's about for them, for many of them and for me, it's more than just... I enjoy this computer game, right? It's about considering a different way of relating. Uh, and I wanted to make that possible, you know? And I think that intergenerationally is the way to do it um, because I don't think that that knowledge is missing. I think it's just people aren't looking in the right place. Does that make sense? Yeah, you you mentioned uh, a healthy community, and lately I've been practicing something for my own health, and I take a media and social media diet occasionally. You know, I, I could use another kind of diet, but uh, I'll, right now I'm just sticking to social media and uh, general media because I've been online since 1983 in the early days of the PC, and it, it was very rudimentary then, but as it grew, I, my use of media and social media really got to the point where it was taking over my life. And I had to recently just decide a little less is better. Yeah. And it's, and it really is good for your health. Yeah, I agree. And I really want to see a line directly from Elms Bright to Fizz Space. So you know, I want, what I would like to see is, you know, people going out and trying things and coming back and saying, hey, I did this. This is what went right. This is what went wrong. Like, you know, what have you done? Right. And it's a, it's a way of uh, not just creating a community, but creating capability, maybe revealing capability is a better way of putting it. Um, because I think you're right that uh, you can get on social media and it can be all that you do. Right. It could be the beginning and the end, which I think not out of intent necessarily. One thing I think about a lot is that the people who design these systems um, are often also victims of them. Right. Because you're not trying to, you know, you're not you're not thinking about it. Right. And you're not you're not intending great evil, but you've created this system and now you're just as inside of it as everybody else. But I think um, a condition of social media being the sort of 
this sort of catch all experience where it is the beginning and the end is you existing in that space is it is it makes you feel it makes a person feel a little bit a little bit more alienated from themselves a little bit less capable a little bit more stuck in this in this mindset that isn't that doesn't lend itself to agency or to making decisions or to being in the world as a person sort of acting upon it um and that uh the less of that we have the more easily we become as a whole be manipulated but also i think the less happy we are you know i think most people enjoy <laughs> creating they enjoy uh the those sorts of activities and expressing themselves in in more authentic ways and so i would you know it's a thing i think about you know when i think about my own social media diet what i think about is like you know, I need to spend less time on social media and more time writing, more time taking classes in ceramics, more time cooking, more time gardening, more time getting beers with my friends, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like being physically in the world, doing things that, uh, that make me feel like me. Right on. Well, we have reached the end of the hour. Can you believe it? Thanks. So this was this was a great conversation. I, you know, I'm still thinking of other things to talk about, but we've run out of time for this one. But maybe you could come back sometime and totally. we'll talk some more. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks a no lot. Problem. All right. Really appreciate it. Thanks for it. having me on. Thank you. Okay. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.